Okay. All right. So welcome everybody and Odette, you have the floor for Read What You Eat. Well, hello. And um, I just wanted to say before I get started that I would like to see all of you from the shoulders down, whatever we get to meet. I see everybody from the shoulders up, I, it's like from here up, that's all we got. I have no idea if you have big butt or <laughs> thin legs, whatever. Uh, so yeah, it would be fun to do that. Um, I'm going to attempt to do a shared screen here for you guys. Now I do know that it is, uh, um, I do know that it is uh, April Fool's Day, but the things that I'm going to tell you are true. So just be aware of that. Now, are you seeing? Are you seeing the what I'm seeing, or no? No, not not. We're not. Okay, let me back out of here and go. So if you go to share screen, Odette, and then it says uh, share. Uh huh. I got yeah, that. You're doing it. Do it. Yep. There you go. Now you go. Now you should go to your slides. Okay. There you go. Oh, you get an A plus, Odette. <laughs> you did that faster than I do it. <laughs> well, it's all those years that I taught. Uh, I taught online. I used to write online classes, actually, and uh, that was that was one of the things that, and I had planned on doing that for uh, the rest of my life, but that didn't work. <laughs> So, well, guess what? You're still doing it this way. So yeah. there you go. Exactly. So, so as I was saying, I know that this is um, you know April Fool's Day, but this is not April Fool's. Everything that I have on this tape and everything I'm going to tell you today is absolutely true. Uh, you can you can Google it if you want to. Uh, one of the things is um, that most lay people don't really know what they're reading when they're looking at their their um, their food and especially with processed food it's really difficult for uh, most people to understand what they're looking at so I just wanted to bring some of the major ones up there's a lot more out there uh, but these are things that I think that are going to be important to all of you now if you have questions uh, Wendy, I'm going to ask you to work with me if you could get the, uh, the comments or whatever, if anybody has any questions. You could just stop me in the middle, whatever, and, and I'll answer your questions. So, okay, let's get started. So we're going to cover three major uh, areas. One is nutritional <coughs> labeling, since we have a new nutritional label, and it's kind of being slowly introduced into the public uh, as we speak. We also, I'm going to also talk to you about what a GMO is, as well as genetic alterations in our food products, uh, so that you know what those are, and also uh, general definitions of food labeling. Now, some of this food labeling is actually on your food, and other food labeling are things that restaurateurs, chefs, people like me are privy to that y'all aren't pretty too. Um, and it, I think it's kind of diabolical, quite a few of the things that, they, that they're doing with our food. So let's go ahead and get started on our nutrition. Um, if you look at the one on the left-hand side, the nutrition facts on the left-hand side, that's the one that we have now. If you look to the one on the right-hand side, that's the new label. Now, if you look at it, most of the information and most of the regulations that they've written are simply, you know, the word calories is bigger, uh, you know, those kinds of things. But a couple of things that they did do that really makes sense is uh, that they've, they've made the portions realistic uh, so that, you know, you're actually eating something. Um, one of my favorites was ice cream. Uh, a portion of ice cream was a quarter of a cup. How many of you have ever eaten a quarter cup of ice cream? No. So the reason why they would do that is because they wanted their calorie count to be lower. So if I said your you know, portion is a quarter of a cup, the person, a lot of people are just looking at the calories. They're not looking at the portion. So you need to look at the portion 
and as well as what the calories are. And, and like I said, most companies nowadays are really making the portions realistic. Uh, then you have also the total fat, saturated fat, and trans fat, and I'll cover that in, in, a, in a slide in a few minutes. Uh, another major thing that they've added to this is including the added sugar. Uh, this is not necessarily the natural sugar that's in the food. So if you're making, if you have orange juice or apple juice, the natural sugars that come from that juice are they're counted, but they're not, they're not added. The ones that will be added that they use are what they call nutritive sugars. And that could be honey or uh, you know, sugar or um, agave or any of those other types of things. Uh, and I'll cover that a little bit more as well. Uh, the vitamins and minerals that they cover have changed they still have a uh, vitamin, what is it? Um, the iron is still the same and the calcium is still the same. They've dropped uh, vitamin A and vitamin C because uh, the population no longer has shortages of those. The average person in the United States gets enough of, of vitamin A and vitamin C. However, on the other hand, we, don't, we aren't getting a, enough of the vitamin D. Uh, a lot of that comes from people wearing sunscreen all the time now. You used to be able to get vitamin D just simply by being outside uh, and getting some sun on your skin, but now everybody's covered up. So as, uh, my, doctor, my doctor told me that probably, you know, just about everybody that lives in Pennsylvania needs vitamin D <laughs> because, well, you know, well, we, do have, we don't have really bright sunny days very often. Sometimes we do and it's great when it happens, but it's not often enough for us to get the vitamin D. Uh, and the other one is potassium. The potassium has been added <coughs> excuse me, as another item that, that a lot of people are low on. And uh, I know myself, the potassium, sodium levels and all of that have, have sometimes been a bit of an issue. Now, total fat, you have two forms of fat. One is saturated fat and one is trans fat. Now, the easiest way to tell whether you have a saturated fat is if it stays solid at room temperature. If it's solid at room temperature, that means that it's a saturated fat. And it generally comes from animals, uh, butter, lard, meat fats, uh, things of that nature. That's where you're gonna get uh, saturated fats. Uh, one of the things that, that I've noted uh, that, that's ha happened is the trans fats. The trans fats, the manufacturers actually take a liquid fat and by hydrogenating it, they make it a solid fat. So that was Crisco. Everybody knows Crisco, right? Crisco, Oleo, that, that is 100% trans fat. It is a hydrogenated lipid that is made to be solid. And that's, that's the difference between Crisco and vegetable oil. So if you took vegetable oil, hydrogenated it, it would be solid. Also, if you take Crisco and you melt it, it becomes a liquid. So that's the, the hydrogenated situation. And that uh, Crisco is called a shortening. And that's, that's where the shortening comes from, as well as margarines. Most, a lot of the margarines uh, have a lot of trans fats in them. You're also gonna find trans fats in uh, a lot of restaurant food because uh, the deep fat fryer that they use is still, it still includes trans fats because the trans fats uh, stay <coughs> at a higher smoke point. We talked about, was it this group we talked about smoke points uh, when I did the, the cooking? It gives them a higher smoke point. So therefore their fat will last longer uh, while, they're, while they're using it to cook with. Trans fats are the ones now that they're beating up. Saturated fats for the longest time was, you know, that was the big bad no-no. You know, drop butter, eat lean meat, you know, lard became, you know, like the devil. 
and you know you were supposed to have margarine and and all of these artificially made things that turned out to be the really bad guys the trans fats build up in your body and they they're they're a carcinogen so you want to you want to really cut those out as much as you can uh Oh, Dad, do you want me to ask the questions that pop up as we're going along or at the end? What do you prefer? Oh, as we go along. That's fine. Okay, so um, Keith has, how does plant-based butter fit into this? And I also had a, a question about the, um, what is it, the coconut, um, not the coconut, the, um, is it coconut oil? Coconut oil, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I, so Keith's asking about plant-based butter and I'm asking about the coconut oil. Where do those fit in? Okay, plant-based butter is a new way of saying margarine because margarine is vegetable, it's the same thing with the trans fat. It's vegetable oil that has, was liquid and then they hydrogenated it to make it solid. Now there are other ways of, of, of causing the vegetable oil to be thick um, and a lot of better products are going to have that, but the veg, you know, it's just the veg new thing. They're using the word vegetarian or plant-based uh, just to get people to buy stuff, you know, but it, we've been eating plant-based margarine forever, as a matter of fact. Margarine actually was created in World War II to, uh, so that the butter could go to the men at, at war, and um, I, I don't think any of us are old enough. I know my mother and my father told me stories of they would get a, um, a pound of oleo, which was like Crisco, it was a white block, and there was a yellow button on the top of it, and they had to knead the button in, and that gave it the flavor and the uh, color. So uh, that's where that's where margin, margarine came from. Uh, another thing, just a comment, and this is for anybody that's not Jewish or Muslim, lard is making a huge comeback. Uh, and I personally uh, love lard for things like you know, pie crusts and cookies and things of that nature. And, you know, I know it's, <coughs> it's an animal based product, but it's something that if you're not, if you're not a vegetarian or a vegan, uh, you might want to try it. If you, a lot, because a lot of people really had problems when Crisco went out, went away. Um, another thing that's happening with this that you'll find in the grocery store is uh, a lot of, margarines and shortenings and all that like you can still buy crisco but it's not crisco it's it's another product so it's been it's not hydrogenated you can buy the original crisco and then right next door to it is the new crisco and that's um they're not the same it's not going to work out as well for you now the coconut oil uh wendy is a, is a good oil for you it is solid at uh, room temperature but it's one of it's one of the few, uh, and it, it but it 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 is a uh, I believe it's a polysaturate rather than a, a, a trans you know, than than a saturated fat. Saturated fat is that all the molecules are covered with uh, another uh, type of of chemical in the molecular level, and then you have mono unsaturated fats, which means there's only one component that's covered. Uh, polysaturated, that means the multiples are covered, but it's not that bad. Saturated fat is the one that has the highest uh, fat content and the highest uh, issue with your diet. And, and so what is the healthiest, you know, butter to use? And, and um, Keith also said pe uh, peanut oil, is that another, is that a healthy oil? Like what would, what would be the healthiest oils to think about? Well, peanut oil is very health, very healthy. It's also very good for cooking. It, uh, we talked about the smoke points. Uh, smoke points just simply means that you know the temperature that you can heat it to before it starts to smoke. Peanut oil is uh, second only to avocado oil, mm -hmm. as far as uh, smoke point is concerned. And so, if you're doing any kind of deep fat frying or anything like that, especially um, <coughs> excuse me, Asian cooking, uh, that's what they commonly use is uh, peanut oil quite often. 
But now that we have an awful lot of people that have peanut allergies, that's that's become another issue in order for people to to really, you know, identify food that has peanut oil. Okay, I I would say you know if you if you look at the you're you're going to have to read the actual food product and see what it see what it is and see what it's made out of. Okay, it has to say trans fat. If it ha if uh, if we go back to the to the label, it actually is on the label. It says total fat, saturated fat, trans fat. So if there's trans fat in there, you, they have to tell you. So if your margarine doesn't have that on there, if it says zero, then you're probably fine, Keith. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, carbohydrates. We're talking about dietary fiber. We have the simple soluble and we also have a complex non-soluble. Now, if you think about this, uh, the soluble fiber is like, like jello, like, like a blob that doesn't, doesn't change. It just goes into your system and it kind of rolls around in there and takes up space. Uh, so it, it it doesn't have any nutritional value whatsoever. And the same is with the con uh, the complex, which is the non-soluble. Now, non-soluble is anything that's hard. And the easiest way for me to explain it to you is we've all eaten corn on the cob. And today I eat corn on the cob and tomorrow I see corn in the toilet, right? Mm -hmm. It's gone from one end to the other and it didn't change. That's fiber, okay? So you could have, there's all different kinds of fiber and I'm gonna get into that much more in depth a little bit down the line. But if you think about that, the, the non-soluble fiber goes through your, your body more like a, um, like a scrubby pad. So if you have anything in your intestines that are an issue uh, that, you know, you know, that you want to keep your intestines, and you do want to keep your intestines in your colon clean, the fiber will actually scrub that system out so that you'll, you'll be eliminating a lot of the carcinogens and things that are in your uh, gastrointestinal system. And then your sugars, you, we talked about you have the added sugars that are uh, included, and that includes all nutritional sweeteners. Now, that's what they call anything that has calories. Now, the, I never thought of calories as nutrition, but as far as the government is concerned, that's how they're, they're stipulating it. So if it's a nutritional sweetener, it adds calories to your food. If it does not have calories, if it's not like a Splenda or a, you know a, any of those artificial sweeteners, it is not considered to be nutritional uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't add anything, including calories to, to your food. So you, know, you have one, you have one way or the other you know, to look at those. I don't know. I personally am not a fan of uh, artificial sweeteners, uh, just simply because of the fact that I would rather have something that tastes a little bit of something that tastes good than a lot of something, that, a lot of something that tastes bad. So I'd rather drink half of a real Coke than all of a Diet Coke. That's just me. You know, everybody makes their decision. Uh, and I have no problem with sugar. I'm, I have no diabetes or anything like that. And that's another consideration that you need to take in. Does somebody have a question? No? Well, cancer hates sugar, right? Sugar feeds cancer. Right, yeah. exactly. So that's that's part of it. That's a big part of it. And it's a big part as far as like your, your decision making. But I've cut most of the sugar out of my diet, but I still like to have that little bit of Coke or whatever. And rather than, than go on diet, because, well, of the non the non-nutritional um, sweeteners do have issues quite often, quite a few of them do. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're kind of changing one for the other. And another thing is if you drink, if you consume a lot of them, um, 
it actually works in reverse as far as your, you know, people drink diet sodas and eat diet foods uh, to lose weight. But what happens is it, it works in reverse in your system because of, the, because of the connection between your stomach and your brain. Your brain, you know, your stomach tells, tells the brain that you're eating sweet stuff and your brain goes, okay, sweet stuff, that means we're gonna get that sugar rush and your body's set up for the sugar rush, but then it never comes. And so you continuously are, are building this, you know, expectation in your system that never arrives. So it, they're finding now that it's actually causing people to eat more sweets because your body is expecting the sugar. And then, you know, so people, that's why people splurge a lot of times. They'll, you know, they'll have Diet Coke, <laughs> Diet Coke with a, a container of Oreos. And <laughs> that doesn't work, it doesn't do anything for you. Okay, now the other thing is, is uh, the next thing is the percentage, it's, it's written as percentage DV. And what that is, is the percentage of the daily value. So when you look at the percentages that they have, I don't know if, can you, if you can see my cursor, but right here, all of this nutrition is in percentages. And up here, all your fibers percentages, as well as the fats and, fats and cholesterols and sodium. This is based on a 2000 calorie a day diet. So if you're eat, consuming 2000 calories a day in your diet, uh, here in this case, where whatever this product would be, you're getting 45% of the iron that you need in a day, okay? Uh, so when you think about how, what, how much of iron you need, you know, that means that you've eaten 45%, you need to add to that, okay? Uh, and it, so that you can balance your nutrition. My cat and I are gonna have an argument in about two seconds. <laughs> Okay, back to here. Okay, now the genetic alterations in meats and vegetables. Um, there's a good and there's a bad. And uh, I think the major thing is that people don't really know what their what GMOs and GEs are. This is a basic, uh, you know, graph of of what we're talking about. GMO stands for genetically modified organism. And GE is genetically engineered. Uh, they're different. Uh, GMO, uh, it's, it's actually GMO is, is a slightly older way of doing uh, the, the alterations. Uh, the genetically engineered is more of the newer way of doing things and what will probably continue uh, in the future. Now your bioengineered uh, Food products as a term that from 19 or from 2016 Senate bill using the, to describe GE, but the FDA says their definition leaves out many GE foods. So what what they're saying in, is the bioengineered is another term that you can hear about GMOs or gen, uh, genetically all, uh, engineered. Uh, natural on a food label, basically, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, it doesn't really mean anything. It, it, it means that the, the label on food uh, that don't contain any added colors and any added flavors for synthetic substances. But we're going to talk about some of the things that they can add that are called natural in, in our food products. And then you have the non-GMO. And those are, uh, those are traditional agricultural practices. Uh, you know, our corn that we eat now started out looking a lot more like wheat centuries ago. Uh, and the farmers, you know, collected the, the maize as it got more and more kernels on it and became more and more edible. So they, they, uh, <coughs> they, 
across the plants so that they would get the feature that they wanted. Now this could take generations. Um, the, the GMO in the, the genetic engineering, all of that happens rather quickly. These are foods that are uh, genetically altered. Genet you have, so the major one and my favorite one actually is tomatoes. The first time I ever heard of genetic modification was probably about two decades ago, maybe even longer than that. And uh, one of the things that they had done was uh, they had altered tomatoes. And you can see this by the fact that when you go to the grocery store, every single tomato looks exactly the same, right? They're all the same size, they're all the same color, they're, they're a little clones of each other. So one of the problems that they had with tomatoes was that the tomatoes, a tomato will freeze at exactly 32 degrees. So if at any point a tomato hits that frozen 32 degrees, they will freeze and a frozen tomato is totally useless. It can't be used for anything. The flavor changes, <clears throat> the texture changes. It's really not a good thing. <clears throat> The, on the other hand, there was a flounder that lived in the Antarctic. And this flounder actually lived in the frozen salt water. And it, so it had a type of um, antifreeze in its system. So they genetically altered the, uh, the tomato by taking the, the antifreeze gene out of the fish and putting it in the tomato. So now the tomatoes don't freeze at such a high temperature. <laughs> so, I mean, that was the, that, and that was my, I'm not saying that's the original one, but that's the initial one that I heard of. And I always thought that was rather weird that, you know, who would ever think, take a piece of you know, a gene out of a fish and put it into a tomato, but they did. Um, Apples are genetically altered, and uh, that's amazing because apples, there are, there are thousands of types of apples that are out there. But the new ones that, were, that are coming to the market, those are genetically altered. Um, I know I, I, I may have told this group that my dad, uh, he was in the horticulture quite a bit, and he had an apple tree that had five different types of apples that grew on it. And it's really easy to alter an apple simply by uh, what's called splicing. You take a piece of one tree and you put it on the other tree and they grow together and it makes two different types of, of apples. The vegetable oils, as you see here, canola, um, corn, cottonseed, soy, they're all, uh, they're all genetically altered papaya, summer squash, corn. Corn is probably the most altered simply because of the fact that they, they make the high fructose corn syrup out of the corn and they also make ethanol out of corn. So they've been genetically altered for each of those purposes. Uh, packaged foods, you can, if it's an American product, it probably has GMOs in it. The sugar beets, uh, because most of American sugar comes from beets, we think we get our sugar from cane, but it's not. You can buy cane sugar, but it has to say cane sugar. If you buy just something that's called sugar, it's probably from a sugar beet. Um, and, you know, that's just a slight difference. Then you also have your dairy products that have been changed, uh, farmed fish, <coughs> and especially salmon. Salmon is a major issue because not only is it genetically altered, but it's also farm raised. And what happens is the fish doesn't turn that bright, beautiful red that you're, we're, we commonly know as salmon. It, it remains gray. And so what they have to do with a genetically altered salmon is they have to dye it so that it's orange or red. So if you're buying farm-raised salmon and it's red, you're eating dyes that you're not being informed of. Okay, the new way of changing uh, the food, which is genetically engineered, is uh, through a, a new product called CRISPR. And that's, CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly 
interspaced short palindromic repeats. Okay, all together, we're going to say that. <laughs> no, we're not. Uh, if you look at this little picture here that I have, you have your DNA strand. Okay, and what they do is they simply go in with CRISPR. It's just like a pair of scissors. It cuts this one portion of that DNA strand out. And then you can take another portion of another DNA strand and put that in there. So you can, you can actually change um, uh, uh, genetic alteration. You can make this genetic alteration uh, instantaneously. And then as the, the food item or whatever continues to grow, that DNA molecule will complete, continue to complete its, it will grow over and over, it will repeat itself over and over and over again. So that becomes the major, the major gene. Um, and it, it's just very simply, it, it's increasing the speed and the accuracy of how they're changing our food. And I'll discuss like how they're doing that down the line. Uh, GMO and GE foods do not need to be in, in, included on any food labels in the United States. It was decided back in the Bush era that Americans did not need to know that their food was genetically altered. So you will never find a food product out there that says GMO, a genetically modified food that won't, you'll never see it in the United States. On the other hand, GMOs and genetic, genetic engineered foods are banned in many of the EU countries. Uh, I think I can remember, I think it was this group that we had a conversation with about uh, Aldi's. Aldi's, a lot of people, oh, you know, that's that's low quality product and all that. No, it's not. It's, it's owned by a German company. They follow German guidelines. So they have very little as far as genetically modified foods. They do have some, but anything that has the Aldi's label or the signature label on it is going to be GMO free. And they don't put anything on there. They don't label anything with that. Uh, you know quite often, so you don't know, but it, G, all these is good product. Um, okay, food altered for transportation purposes. You have beef, tomatoes, peaches, and nectarines, and bag salad. The beef, uh, the reason why it was changed is because beef used to be slaughtered in the Midwest and transported to the East uh, by the sides. The, they would butcher the, the animal split it in half, hang it by its back ankle, and put it on a train. And what happened is because of that, the weight of the, the beef that was moving in the cattle, in the cars, would actually tip over a lot of the trains. So that was not very profitable. So what they did was they, they started genetically altering the cows so that the nice round voluptuous cows that used to live out on the range are now square. If you look at the hind end of a cow, it's now actually shaped like a box. And they butcher the animals down to what they call primal cuts, and primal cuts fit in a box. The boxes can be stacked inside the train, and the train doesn't fall over anymore. Uh, the tomatoes we've already talked about, they have, uh, they have uh, the flounder gene in them. They also are not ripe. If, if you buy a, a a tomato and the giant eagles or any grocery store it's a green tomato and that's why it has very little flavor uh what they do is they they gas the, they, they pick the green tomatoes package them and then gas them and that makes them actually turn red but they're not ripe so the unripe tomatoes are much hardier stronger than a ripe tomato a ripe tomato can be smushed really easily so that's another thing. Then we also have the peaches and nectarines. If you've had an apricot lately, unless you picked it off your own tree, you had a peachicot. They've matched the apricot or uh, genetically altered the apricot with peaches so that they could be transported. And again, the peaches and the nectarines are being, they, being um, picked when they're 
not ripe and they're colored so that you think it's ripe. But the, how many of you have had nectarines and peaches that are just like biting into a piece of wood? Uh, and I see your hands up there. It's just, it's not worth it to spend the money on them. They look beautiful, but they taste horrible. And then the last thing is bag salads. The, re the way the bag salads can get to your door without being brown is they remove all of the oxygen from the bag. The reason why lettuces and things of that nature and other vegetables uh, and fruits like apples are a very good example. The reason why they turn brown is called oxygenation. And what that, that means is that the contact of oxygen to that food actually makes it turn brown. So they've pulled all of the, the oxygen out of the bag and they've replaced it with an inert gas. So if you buy bag salads, Keep them closed. Don't open them. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, you got to open them up and you got to pat them dry and you got to swirl them around. No, leave it alone. It's going to last longer if you just don't open the bag. Uh, foods that are off altered for profit, obviously, meats, chicken, uh, seafood are definitely, you know, those are the high price items. So those are the things that they've altered. Uh, you know, the chicken here in the United States, we have one type of chicken that we eat. I was in China and I walked through one of those markets like they talk about in Hunan where you know, COVID came from. Uh, it's called a wet market. And they had like 10 different types of chickens. And the chickens, the chickens themselves, the skins in the, in the, the meat of the chickens were actually, there were black ones, there were red ones, there were yellow ones, and each chicken had some type of, you know, you use this one for soup and you use this one for saute. And you, so they have this wide variety. On the other hand, we have uh, one type of chicken and they've been bred and genetically altered with large breasts. Uh, because Americans like lunch breasts. <laughs> that's what we're looking for. We, uh, you know, that's why breast meat is so expensive, but that's why they do it. Now, one of the things that's happening, and you might find this out if you're a chicken breast fan, is that uh, there's a, a condition that's going on with the, the genetically altered chicken. It's called wood breast. And have, have you bought any breast meat that is really tough? and it seems to dry out really quickly, that's that's what the problem is. It has a, a wooden breast. So they have to redevelop the, um, the genes for that. Bread is genetically altered. Uh, the bread situation, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the fibers and things in a, in, a, in a second. And then we have prepared foods. Prepared foods, you are going to be surprised when I get into the next thing of definitions. And the restaurant foods, I think my last slide will probably turn you off for restaurants. <laughs> so, there's, a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of things out there. If you are a huge processed meat fan, you are eating insects, rodent hair, rodent droppings, pesticide residue, bulking products, and bacteria and viruses. Okay. Because the government has a term called allowable parts per million. And what that means is if they go and take a sample of your bologna or a sample of your um, hot dog or a sample of any of those types of processed foods, they are allowed to have those things in that product that's going directly to sale to you. Okay, it's not, it, they're not taking, they're, they're allowed to do that. So if you bite into a hot dog and you find what looks like a rodent dropping, it probably is. Okay, and it's allowable. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't sue anybody. You can't say, you know, this is, this is a bad thing. Like the thumb in the chili. Yeah, that was a suable situation, but Insects in your hot dog, not so much. Uh, food alterations for good. The reason why they started food alterations was because um, 
because of nutrition and, and uh, famine issues that are happening, that have been happening in Africa for decades. Uh, so they want to be able to increase the production. They want to also increase the nutrition. Uh, the first thing that, that I ever heard of uh, was called golden rice. And what that was, was they crossbred the rice with uh, carrots so that the rice got uh, carotenoids in it. And so the, the orange of the carrot was transferred along with the nutrients of the carrot that went into the rice. Because rice is something that, that people would have to eat. They're used to it and they knew what to do with it. So putting the carrot in there made sense. Uh, also to end hunger, uh, as far as protein is concerned, uh, we're gonna run out of the amount of protein we need to sustain life in the world in a matter of a decade. So we're, we're not going to be capable of making the amount of protein products uh, if we don't make changes and they don't you know, do the genetic modifications. Uh, they have developed plants that have uh, less pesticides, need less pesticides, they need, need less herbicides. Uh, there's one particular uh, corn that is um, Roundup proofed. Uh, so if you have this type of corn and you get weeds all under your corn, you can go in and just spray the Roundup all over the place, which I would suggest you not do. Um, but it'll kill the weeds, but it won't kill the corn. So that's a very easy way for industrial corn to, to be produced. It's also, uh, there's also developments in drought tolerance so that the, uh, the food can last more with less, with less water. Um, right now in the United States, the, uh, the west to the middle west of the United States is in a huge drought. I think it's called 100, I think they called it a 100 year drought. Uh, which is one of the worst that we've been seeing in, in the United States. So what they're doing is, is making plants that can live with less water. And then also making disease resistant uh, foods. The major one for me is cocoa. Did any of you hear that there was going to be a big shortage of chocolate in the near future? And the reason is, is because there's a disease that's gone through the chocolate manufacturing places and they, they've started coming up with cocoa that's disease resistant, which, you know, it's good in one way and that's not necessarily good in the other. Okay, here we go with your definitions. The truth about what is in our food, fiber. Fiber is non-digestible vegetable matter. Like I said before, it goes in one end, comes out the other and it does not change. Fiber has no nutritional value. It simply balks your, your stool so that it, you pass it better. So that's why, you know, a lot of, a lot of us are, have been told, you know, like fiber, fiber everything. But what's happening in the, in, in the uh, processed food area is they're adding a product called cellulose. And if you look into that top paragraph there, about halfway down, there's, uh, there's parentheses uh, that, that will tell you that many of the sources of cellulose are wood pulp, cotton, and other vegetable matter. And by other vegetable matter, that means uh, stems and seeds and everything that you would not commonly eat off of, off of, the, um, off of the, a plant. Uh, the fiber supplements go, uh, the one that really hit me the first was the, uh, the uh, fiber in the, in the high fiber breads. Because a lot of people, you know, when high fiber diet, that's the first thing they do, they go to the high fiber breads and they uh, don't realize that they're eating a tree. You know the wood pulp that's in there. It's also a thickening agent and an emulsifier that can get, that can be in your yogurt or your ice cream um, or any of those things. Calorie and it's a calorie re reducer. My father, a long time ago, I must have been like ten, said, you know, if they could just make sawdust into a pill, 
you could lose weight. It's true. I mean, at the time, I didn't, you know, it's like, oh, dad, you're just talking stuff. But the reality of it is, is in order to make your calorie, reduce the calories in a lot of the foods that are processed, they add the cellulose because it is a vegetable. It's it's going to pass through your system without making any changes. Um, And last but not least, our shredded cheese. If you, how many of you buy shredded cheese and you feel it and it kind of has a little bit of a powder on it? That's cellulose. Uh, Mm -hmm. And again, so the, and, the, and they're using it as an anti-caking agent so that the cheese doesn't get smushed back into a brick. Uh, so it stays separated. Uh, the word fresh. If you have a fresh written on your label, it means that it's less than 30 days old. Uh, I would hope that it would be less than, way less than 30 days old. Uh, and also that it can, it can have added waxes and coatings. Uh, it also can have post-harvest pesticides and it can be frozen. So you can have a fresh product that has been hit with uh, pesticides to keep the, the roaches or whatever off of your vegetables. Then they can be waxed and frozen and they're still fresh churned, whipped, and spread means they're adding air or water. If you have churned or whipped something, they're adding air. And if you have a spread, like a margarine spread, it's adding water. Uh, And why would they do that? Is that going to just make it that much tastier and that much better for you? No. It's so that they can sell you air so that the food product has more volume. So when you look at something that has been churned or whipped, and in the industry it's called sparged, it looks bigger, but that's because there's air in it. On the other hand, the spread, if you buy a spread, let's say we have butter spread or margarine spread, if you have natural butter, natural margarine, it's hard. You can't spread it on your, on your bread right away. But if you take a margarine spread, you can put it right on your on your bread and it'll move you know, like spread right around and be lovely. It's because they've they've emulsified it with water. And the water is what's making it easier to to spread. Uh, so look for the those words when you're looking at your food product. Um, the churned is like almost always in ice cream. Uh, whipped is in all different kinds of things, from cream cheese to to uh, you know yogurts and all of those types of things. And the spreads they have to say if it's a spread. So if it says margarine spread, you know that you're getting you're buying water. And it's just a way to get your money out of your pocket. Here's another one. I had a situation just recently that I bought some glazed chicken breasts. They were um, What it is, is a process where they take the individual piece of food and while they're freezing it, they add water to it. They add water so that the exterior of the meat is covered in water. And the the ideal process for this is that you won't get um, freezer burn. Freezer burn is is dehydration at frozen temperatures. So that's a good thing. But when you actually defrost the chicken breast, you lose half of the weight. So if you're buying these chicken breasts for $5 a pound, you're actually buying them for $10 a pound because $5 of what you're paying for is water. Shrimp sizes, when you hear the words, extra large, large jumbo, all of that, if they just have the word, it means nothing. And you see this in a lot of restaurants. They're telling you that they're feeding, they're giving you, you know, jumbo shrimp or they're giving you, you know, extra colossal. No, they're not. They're giving you a smaller shrimp and telling you that's the size that it's supposed to be. It's if there's not the numbers that are in the middle, the shrimp count numbers, the U10, U12, 16 to 20, 
those are the amount, the numbers of shrimp that are actually in a pound. So if you buy a pound of 3640, you're going to get 36 to 40 shrimp in a pound. So that means they're going to be smaller than if you buy the 16 to 20 shrimp. Added water, uh, you read this quite often as broth and or sa uh, salt solution that's added to your meats. And what they do is they just simply bulk up your meats. You have a situation with chicken here a lot of times. Chicken, turkey is a, is a one that they're, they're bulking up the turkeys with broth. Uh, if you read the package on the side of your, I don't know if you have a turkey for Easter, but if you, you read the side of your turkey package, you'll see that it, it has water just added, water added. And it can be up to 15%. So it can make a huge, a, a huge difference in how much you're actually paying for the, for the turkey. Because if turkey is frozen and it has water in it, when the turkey defrosts, the water will leave the turkey. So you end up with less turkey. <laughs> a defrosted turkey weighs less than a frozen turkey. Um, the only thing that you should see that it has this water added is hams. Hams, uh, bacon, anything that's cured, it's cured in water. So it has to have the water added. Natural. Now, when you see the word natural on your food products, you think, oh, this is natural to the food product. So if you're getting uh, in the, the one major one that was just recently on the news was uh, a Muslim and Jewish organizations sued Starbucks because what was making their um, one smoothie uh, a beautiful, bright orange color was uh, ground roaches. And, and so uh, a roach is natural, right? A roach is a natural thing. It comes from the earth. It grows here. But we generally don't put it into our smoothies. Um, but by doing that, by Starbucks doing that, anybody that had a religious, um, you know, law that they weren't allowed to eat, you know, certain types of, of animals and both Jewish and Muslims are not permitted to eat bugs. Uh, they were they were feeding them something that was breaking their law. And it's just not a good thing. I mean, there's a lot of different things that are out there. They use um, beaver oil that comes from the bile sac of the beaver to uh, make better flavors of things. Uh, so that's considered a natural flavoring. Okay. I never really wanted to eat you know, the bow sack of a beaver, but hey, it's in our food products. So make sure that you're reading that. Now, this one is the one that I said is probably going to really get you. It's called Mooglu. It's, you want to remember this word, transglutamate glutaminous. It is a, a blood enzyme that comes from an animal uh, that is used as a coagulating agent. And what it does, it is actually holds pieces of meat together so that they look like another piece of meat. And I have a YouTube here. It's only a minute long. Let's pull that up. I'm sorry. I gotta do control click. And what you'll see, hopefully, is that this woman is taking chuck, which as we know is a, a lesser meat. Okay, let's do this one more time, control. And they take pieces of, of the chuck, they add the mooglu, and then they refrigerate it for a number of hours. They form it into a shape, then refrigerate it for a number of hours, and then at the end, they actually can sell that chuck as a tenderloin or a filet mignon. Uh, there's it, this isn't this isn't playing for me. So uh, when you get a chance and you can go on Google, go to uh, Frankensteak, and you'll see a man that will actually use this mooglu to make a, a ribeye steak out of chuck. And you find this more often in restaurants now.
ways, but it's also the way that your chicken nuggets are made and your other, you know, your, your uh, sea, it, it can work on seafood, pork, beef, and chicken. And uh, what they're doing is just simply, you know, adding this product to hold it together, hold the meat together so it can be, you know, processed and fed to you. <coughs> now, the, the thing is, is it's considered a natural ingredient. Because it is a blood enzyme, it is natural. So it can't, sometimes it's not listed as being something in, in a specific food. Your farm-raised seafood um, means that your, your fish or whatever is, is uh, raised in a confined environment. They are most often uh, GMO and they're quite often fed artificial feeds. So that's why the salmon turns out great because of the feeds, the feeds that they give them plus the GMO. And the, the rule is to be able to call your poultry farm, I'm sorry, free range, uh, you have to have a door open in the barn where the animals are growing. So you're, you know, if the chicken feels like going outside, it could go outside. But most chickens don't. And in conclusion, it's just I hope that you know you guys can be better consumers and, and realize what's going on with your food. Uh, so read your food; it's important. Wonderful. Gosh, thanks, Odette. What what a wealth of information. This is all new knowledge for me, for sure. And um, you know, just amazing. You know, um, of um, you know, information. Anybody have any questions? Oh, are you guys seeing this? This is the uh, YouTube. It might yeah, be yeah, you have it playing. That's yeah, up. Okay. Ooh, that's just a minute. I'll show you in a minute. Huh. So there you have it. Wow. <laughs> and that is being done in a lot of restaurants um, that are, you know, just really lying to you about what's what's in your food. So wow. Questions? Anybody have any comments? No, that was well, I thought it was thoroughly informative, but I truly I'm deciding that ignorance is bliss. <laughs> uh, a lot of Americans feel that way. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm teasing. I learned. I learned a lot. Yeah, I, I and I do. I think that is amazing how much you don't you you don't know what goes on, right? And um, you know, and and uh, even if you make it, you know, you read the labels. I think most of us think about reading labels in terms of calories and. Um, you know, just the main ones, sugars and fats, right? But to just know what some of those other um, things mean. And it's interesting because I mentioned you guys, I'm part of a cancer in the environment committee and um, they haven't even touched on how food, you know, is influenced like this. Cause that to me is part of that whole, you know, cancer in the environment. So um, I will bring this up as part of that committee too and how much they're involved or want to be involved in, you know, understanding some of this, what's in, you know, locally, so. So we thank you, Odette, for your time and your talents. This is very um, helpful to us, I 